everybody. This is just a heads up that uh, today's lecture and the discussion will be taking place entirely in English. Uh, предупреждаваме нашата скъпа публика, че днешната лекция и дискусията ще се проведат изцяло на английски и също така ще бъдат записани. Um, so today we will be talking about the sexual sphere of people with disabilities, which, as I'm sure you all know, is usually accompanied by a lot of stereotypes and uh, a lot of general misconceptions. And uh, we will be examining this topic through the category of fundamental rights. So we have with us today Dr. Carla Maria Reale from the University of Genoa and University of Trento. And she is a postdoctoral researcher uh, within the project Gender X. And uh, she has a PhD in comparative public law. So she will be mentioning a lot of the, uh, you know, strictly legal aspects of things as well, which uh, I find really interesting. Uh, she is a member of the Center of Interdisciplinary Gender Studies of the University of Trento and the Biolaw Lab at the University of Trento. And I'm sure you will notice that her research is really interdisciplinary but its main focus is on uh, issues related to gender and sexuality and disability and uh, mostly how they relate to the principle of equality so this is carla and we are very happy and grateful to have her here today thanks for joining us hi everyone well thanks for the invitation uh, it's really a pleasure and also an honor to uh, contribute to what you are doing uh, within the Milieu project. So I'm really glad to be here this morning with you all. And um, as Alexandra already uh, said, I'm going to talk about sexuality and disability from the perspective of the many misconceptions and stereotypes um, that are very well spread in our society. If you want, I can share like the overview of uh, our um, chat today. Uh, the idea is to, uh, I mean, I will probably speak for 40 minutes more or less. Uh, and then of course, uh, the floor is open for uh, question, remarks, to share some thoughts, uh, whatever you want to, uh, to put in common, to share with uh, me and the rest of the audience. Uh, so um, the first thing we're going to do is share some main uh, notion around uh, disability and sexuality and try to understand how and when sexuality became a topic inside disability studies. So this is the first step we're going to do together. Then we are going to examine very briefly some of the main stereotypes and misconceptions around sexuality. And in particular, I'm going to share with you a, a philosophical view, if we want, of uh, coming from political philosophy, okay, uh, of the reason, the main reasons behind these stereotypes and misconceptions. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Alexander already mentioned that I'm a legal scholar, so I don't want to disappoint anyone, and we're going to talk about the role of law. So my main idea was to uh, discuss with you how law might uh, mirror and um, support uh, these stereotypes and misconceptions. So the idea is to examine, uh, in particular, uh, we're going to discuss this case study coming from uh, the Convention on the Rights of uh, Persons with Disabilities, okay? And how, unfortunately, uh, this remarkable treaty managed to, um, unfortunately, again, um, enforce a stereotype view of sexuality, okay? And then we are going to uh, conclude with some final remarks, some thoughts I would like to uh, share with you uh, around um, sexuality, disability, the role of law, uh, and uh, some possible instruments, maybe, that we can use to foster self-determination uh, in the field of sexuality and disability. So this is the, <laughs> the menu for uh, today's chat. Uh, okay, we can start. 
uh, I uh, the first thing we I would like uh, to do is to um, clear the uh, kind of notion of disability we're going to uh, use um, during this uh, lecture. Uh, I will use both the term people with disabilities and disabled people because I support um, I both support the model of um, the UN model, I would say, so uh, people's first language, people with disability, but I also support uh, some points of the social model of disability when we are understanding disability as identity, so identity first language. Uh, and I will probably, in our lecture, I will uh, use both of these uh, terms in an interchangeable way. Uh, of course, during this lecture, we are going to embrace uh, the <clears throat> social model of disability. So we're going to talk uh, about disability as a um, relation of power, okay? And the understanding of disability we can share is uh, this one I, mean, I would like to, to share with you. Uh, so some physical, mental health condition, which meet some, sorry, there's a typo, some disabling social structures, environments, organization, barriers. So again, uh, the idea is uh, to point out how people are disabled by social structure, while at the same time, we do not want to uh, invisibilize the experience of people with disability. So in general, I would like uh, you to consider in this lecture disability as an umbrella for uh, many, many different life experiences and condition. So we are talking about visible and invisible disabilities acquired or from birth, physical or psychosocial. Per disabilities might be permanent from birth, temporary, but also uh, cr some chronic illness might be considered disability as well. Uh, for the barriers they encounter in society, rare diseases, and whatsoever. And of course, uh, I would like you all to keep in mind that uh, disability is part of, it, well, is one of the um, factors of social marginalization. Uh, it's not the only one that people can experience. So of course, uh, we should consider disability as a relational factor. So disability mm, might mm, be experienced beside other conditions that mm, might result in substantial inequalities. So we need to consider the interaction between disability, class, race, gender, sexual orientation, and gender identity. So in general, I would like um, mm, you all to consider that uh, in the um, in this lecture, well, during this chat, um, we should always keep in mind that disability is part of a broader social context, and that and that we might experience disability beside other social uh, factors of marginalization and inequalities and discrimination. Okay, so. Um, Mm, I would like to uh, start with this quote from Anne Finger. She is a, a disability activist from the US. And during the 90s, uh, in one of her articles, she wrote this. Sexuality is often the source of our deepest oppression. It is also often the source of our deepest pain. It's easier for us to talk about and formulate strategies for changing discrimination in employment, education, and housing than to talk about our exclusion from sexuality and reproduction. So, mm, she was saying that sexuality was somehow a hidden source of oppression for disabled people, even within the disability movement itself. 
she was somehow denouncing that uh, sexuality uh, needed to be discussed and tackled uh, together with other very important uh, social issues in disability uh, activism, such as employment and housing, okay? Um, I would like to um, try to analyze with you uh, what is in the core somehow of the intersection between uh, sexuality and disability. And uh, I believe that uh, what we can really uh, find if we look at the um, very uh, essential, I would say, um, part of this intersection is the construction of norm, the norm, the social norm. So what uh, sexuality and disability have in common is that both are very much um, conditioned, I will say, uh, they are very much connected with the construction of a social norm. So uh, again, sexuality is very much regulated in our society. And um, we have a, a clear social idea of, of what, uh, um, what uh, uh, I would say normal uh, sexuality is and what is not. And we are uh, struggling very much to um, challenge this norm. Mm, here we can, mm, we can very much easily find an analogy uh, why we are talking about the LGBTIQ rights movement, for example. Uh, the LGBTI movement is working a lot to challenge the, nor the normative construction of sexuality, if we think about it. At the same time, uh, disability is very much defined by uh, what is considered a normal body or a normal mind for a human being. Uh, and disability, uh, especially if we refer to the individual model of disability or the medical model of disability, was described in terms of uh, how much a person was distant from that norm. So um, I do believe that mm, this topic is uh, peculiar for this reason, uh, because normativity, we can find normativity uh, very much both when we are discussing sexuality as a social issue, but also disability as a social issue. So what happens when uh, these two topics uh, meet? Mm, actually, it is very um, interesting to notice how sexuality emerged in uh, disability studies um, during the 90s, okay? Uh, and um, sexuality managed to emerge as a social issue thanks mainly thanks to um, the creep theory and the feminist disability theory, okay? Why? Uh, because both these uh, theories on disability uh, want to, of course, they embrace uh, the social model of disability. And I, I'm giving for like, I'm giving for grant that we all know what the social model of disability is. Um, but if it is not like this, please tell me, uh, write me in chat, or if we want, if you want, we can discuss this later in case there are some questions around it. So uh, these two models of disability uh, embrace some of the main premises of the social model of disability. Uh, so the idea of uh, disability as a social construct, as a open relation of oppression in society, and the idea that people are not disabled by their own bodies, but they are disabled by the social structure. But at the same time, uh, what this theory want to do, uh, what they want to do is to um, highlight some of the limits of the social model of disability. Uh, one of the uh, things they 
uh, want us to notice is that the social model of disability uh, is very much connected to the experience of disability of the, the main theorist behind this. And these people were all um, male. They had a disability. Um, well, they it was not a disability from birth, but a physical disability that was acquired after some life events. And they were all white people. So what this theorist wants to denounce is that, of course, the social model of disability was fundamental in order uh, to um, for disabled people to gain political subjectivity and to start claiming their own narrative and their own right. But at the same time, uh, the, the strict separation between disability and impairment was somehow mm, invisibilizing some of the experience of people with disability, uh, some of the experience that some people were uh, living. So uh, they denounced that the strict distinction between impairment and disability was contributing to the epistemological invisibility of the bodies disabled bodies. So disabled bodies were disappearing from uh, a public discourse. Again, I would say, because we all know that uh, one of the main struggle for people with disability is to be more visible in public, to uh, go outside the private, I would say, domestic sphere. So in the end, somehow, the social model of disability was failing to address the material, the more material side of many disabled life. And the risk was also to somehow trivialize uh, life with some impairments. Uh, so um, this, both this uh, theory um, put again, the, um, they want to discuss the importance of uh, the lived experience of people with disability, which is why they also say that the struggle for social justice is not simply social, this is a quote again, economic and political, but it's also psychological, cultural, discursive and carnal. So they want to analyze disability as a form of embodiment. <clears throat> and it is thanks to uh, these theories that sexuality finally uh, becomes a field of inquiry, okay? Uh, so the idea is that sexuality is not an individual issue. It's not something that uh, is um, to be confined to the private sphere, but at the same time is not a medical issue because usually sexuality was not a topic at all or it was a topic because it was a medical problem, a medical issue, especially for people with disability. Uh, and they want us to consider disability not as an individual issue, nor a medical issue, but a social issue. So to consider how uh, the construction of disability itself might influence the expression of sexuality, the possibility of uh, sexual expression mm, and self-determination for people with disability. So the idea is to make sexuality a field of inquiry in order to understand the barriers that are in force in this field, how they are socially created, socially constructed, and also to start um, understanding how to dismantle these barriers. And of course, uh, this kind of uh, theorist, I, also, I told you that um, they have a feminist background and a queer background. They also uh, consider the important itself to discuss this dichotomy, this rigid dichotomy between the private sphere 
and the public sphere. And so these are all the uh, field of uh, inquiry. In order to do this, I would um, like to introduce you two of the main notion that uh, were theorized uh, between this field. Actually, one was theorized by uh, Shakespeare. Uh, Shakespeare is not part of the feminist uh, disability theory or the creep theory. He is actually uh, part of the, I would say, intermediate model of disability um, family of theories. Uh, but still, of course, it draws a lot on feminist and creep theories in order to uh, analyze the issue of sexuality. Uh, and he, he's been working a lot, actually, on the issue of sexuality and disability. Uh, he's a sociologist from the UK. Mm, and he uh, uses a lot the notion of sexual citizenship. Mm, which is uh, a notion coming from uh, LGBTI studies, okay? Uh, his idea is to challenge, again, you see the normative assumption on, on sexuality, and in particular, the, normal, the normative assumption on disabled people's sexuality, and the notion of sexual citizenship uh, embraced the idea that um sexual rights are human rights and the idea that people with disabilities should be considered as sexual beings alongside their peer and and then as you can see from the quotation he also said without imposing a notion of what sexuality should entail so again we are questioning the norm Another important notion is the one of sexual accessibility. Mm, and while here I'm using a quotation from Shuttleworth, and he is um, a thinker from the creep theory, okay, the one I mentioned earlier. Um, he says that uh, the idea of sexual accessibility is not related to physical intimacy per se. Mm, what he means with sexual accessibility is uh, a psychological, social, and cultural context that support, acknowledge, nurture, and promote sexuality in general or disabled people's sexuality specifically. And uh, of course, he mentioned the uh, role of media representation in order uh, to reach sexual accessibility, but also access to cultural, social, and psychological supports aimed at improving the possibility for sexual expression and negotiation in the sexual field for disabled people. So uh, you can see somehow um, that both this notion, I mean, the notion of uh, sexual citizenship is very helpful for us in order to uh, try to think about um, the relationship between sexuality and fundamental rights. So the fact that um, expressing one's sexuality is part of a broader, um, project somehow uh, of uh, realization of fundamental rights, basic human rights, while the notion of uh, sexual accessibility uh, help us, I mean, is very useful in order to uh, start thinking about um, how to create a social context that can support and nurture self-determination, okay? So um, the combination of both this notion is very helpful in order to have a broader view of um, what we can do about uh, disabled people's sexuality, how to support uh, the expression of sexuality for everyone. Okay. Um, 
from the I, I mentioned earlier that we were going to discuss very briefly uh, a philosophical perspective on the reason why uh, sexuality and disability itself is a taboo topic, okay? And Finger, we, we mentioned that uh, earlier, and Finger uh, was denouncing how even inside and within uh, the disability movement, sexuality was not considered a topic, and how this fundamental part of everyone's life was not being discussed. And so I would like to share some thoughts with you uh, on the reason why this might happen. Uh, and I would like to uh, draw from the work of Margaret Schildrick. She is a philosopher. She, of course, uh, she is a disabled scholar herself. And um, she's been working a lot on uh, uh, political theory, disability, and sexuality. And Schildrick would like us to think about how the intersection between sexuality and disability touches some deep tension that are rooted in each and every one of us. Why? She says that the um, this encounter, the encounter between sexuality and disability, is considered somehow a threat to the construction of subjectivity according to our liberal culture. How come? Because the normal, again, you see the concept of uh, normativity that comes back again. So the normal subject, uh, according to the liberal culture, is the one who is autonomous and is always in control of their body and their mind. According to the, this view, of course, the person of the, with disability itself challenged this notion because stereotypically is considered a vulnerable, vulnerable person and a, a dependent person. At the same time, sexuality itself is a field where people lose control. So it's a threat itself to, to this idea of the autonomous subject. And what happens is uh, if disability and sexuality, which alone represent a challenge to the notion of an independent, rational subject, meet. Somehow, Schildrich says that the reason why sexuality and disability is a taboo topic is that these two notions together push for the total disintegration of our whole idea of autonomous and rational subject, which is, which is like the, the main uh, subject uh, inside our own liberal uh, culture. Mm. What happens according to, uh, to Schildrich is that usually somehow the condition of vulnerability uh, doing sexuality is managed by uh, able-bodied people uh, successfully, but uh, this is not always considered possible according to the standard for um, disabled body. And somehow she's, uh, she says that this is the reason why uh, the expression of uh, disabled people's sexuality is considered somehow deviant per se, okay? Mm, so mm, uh, I believe that mm, this view might be uh, able to explain us the reason why uh, there is so much mm, difficulty, I would say, uh, in talking about this topic, okay? Mm, and of course, this uh, also helped us uh, in order to understand uh, the root of some of the main stereotypes and misconceptions around disabled people's sexuality. 
So uh, I'm checking the time. Okay. Uh, what happens usually is that people with disability are uh, totally desexualized or they are hypersexualized. Okay. Mm. Their desexualization, for example, is part of the fact that disabled people are not, I mean, in the stereotypical view, are denied agency and adulthood and uh, the possibility to engage consensually in sexuality is considered an important aspect of being adult in our own society. Uh, and the main point behind this is that the denial of sexuality for people with disability is not something irrelevant. On the contrary, it is part of a broader social marginalization of disabled people, part of a broader denial of agency, of self-determination of disabled people. And uh, at the same time, one of the um, main other uh, topic to be considered is the fact that, as I mentioned earlier, in general, sexuality is a film field very much dominated by normativity, and there is no much space for the expression of sexuality of non-conforming bodies. So it's not just for um, disabled people, um, but uh, LGBTIQ people, in particular uh, transgender people, uh, sexuality is considered deviant somehow. Uh, so um, it is interesting somehow to uh, connect all these dots and consider all these uh, issues as part of a broader construction of uh, normativity around the expression of one's sexuality. Um, okay, so I think I have 10 more minutes, something like this, and I would like to uh, use this time in order to discuss with you the role, sorry for the cat. Okay, the, the role of uh, law in this. Um, in general, uh, what happens is that um, role, the role of law is a little bit uh, controversial, I would say. Uh, what we can notice somehow is that there is a growing interest in sexuality. Uh, in particular, sexuality as a part of the expression of um, human rights. But at the same time, there are there are still many deep tension and resistance, okay? Historically, law has had a huge repressive role, especially in the field of sexuality. And again, we have to come back to the norm because the role, the role uh, of law was to enforce uh, the social norm around sexuality. Uh, a very quick example on that, if we think about the criminalization of homosexual conduct, especially in uh, common law countries, but not only. Uh, while during the um, 70s, especially with the feminist movement, and the civil rights movement, somehow um, law was asked to withdraw from the field of sexuality, to uh, decriminalize, but also to deregulate, I would say, the field of sexuality. Uh, while currently we are somehow asking law to uh, take on a um, promotional role when we are in coming to sexuality. So uh, we are asking law to grant self-determination and to dismantle inequalities in the field of sexuality, okay? By the way, as I mentioned earlier, this is an ongoing process. And when it comes to sexuality and disability, we can see somehow that law is still not properly addressing in a promotional way, this topic. On the contrary, somehow law is still mirroring some stereotypes and misconception around disabled people's sexuality. And as I mentioned earlier, I wanted to show you how, unfortunately, the Convention on the Rights of a Person with Disability uh, 
um, lost, I would say, the opportunity to make the difference uh, in this field, uh, in the perspective of uh, human rights law, okay? Uh, well, I don't know if um, some of you might already know this instrument, some may not know this. Uh, the convention uh, was adopted on, uh, I mean, I would say, in 2006, yeah? And then it was signed, it opened to for signature uh, the year later. And actually, uh, this tool is uh, an outstanding tool for many reasons, uh, because it's the first comprehensive treaty on the rights of persons with disability. Uh, but it is also very remarkable because it is uh, the result of the great struggle of association NGO um, of people with disability around the world. And this convention actually represents the full somehow realization of the social model of disability in the field of human rights law. Actually, there are some scholars that argue that the convention created another model of disability, the human rights model of disability. But by the way, this, uh, this point is quite controversial, but it's not, I mean, uh, we're not going to discuss this at the, at the moment. Uh, I just um, wanted you to know that for many reasons, this treaty is a remarkable instrument for many reasons again, as I, as I mentioned earlier. Um, however, in the field of sexuality, somehow many scholars argue that uh, the convention did not manage to uh, fully um, represent uh, the social model of disability, okay? Um, actually, before the convention, uh, there was a um, standard rule on disability from the 90s, and it is important to mention that rule number nine uh, mentioned the issue of sexuality uh, in a very um, proper way, I would say, because rule number nine said that there was a need to balance between the protection from sexual abuse, but also the need to not impede the fulfillment of sexual and effective life for people with disability. So balance between protection and self-determination, but also the standard rule was asking for the states to enact positive measure to contrast negative attitudes towards the sexuality of people with disability and grant sexual education for full, free and consensual sexuality against every form of abuse. Mm, we will expect at this point, the CRPD to go further in this route. But actually what happened is that uh, the convention is a step backwards, not a step forward, okay? Very briefly, I am uh, showing you the uh, article in the convention that are somehow uh, related to sexuality and somehow briefly mention the, the issues around sexuality. Article 23, respect for home and the family, right to health, uh, and also Article 8 on awareness raising actually does not, uh, it can be well, we can apply it in the field of sexuality, but unfortunately does not mention sexuality per se, okay? Uh, so at the beginning, during the negotiation pro process, this article in particular mentioned uh, many affirming provision. So uh, they wanted to uh, enforce somehow some positive rights in the field of sexuality. But during the negotiation, process, this article were amended. And what is now left is basically uh, just negative provision, which means freedom from rights, protection rights, uh, and some indirect references to sexuality, but mostly connected to marriage and right to um, family 
and reproductive health, which of course are some uh, very important issues, but at the same time, they do not fully encompass the whole spectrum of sexuality. We do not, do not have so much uh, time, but here somehow you can see um, this um, table made by um, a scholar, which is called Martha Schaff, uh, and she uh, analyzed specifically the initial uh, formulation of the article I mentioned earlier, and then uh, the final result of the negotiation process. So uh, in general, uh, according to some scholars, what happened is that somehow the convention incorporated a discursive silence on disabled people's sexuality. So um, somehow what happened is that this piece of international law decided not to engage in a discourse around sexuality and human rights. And this itself might be considered a form of regulation. Uh, here again, I quoted um, Schaff, the scholar, and she said that by narrowing sexual and reproductive rights to instances of violence forms, the committee has replicated prejudices that equate disability with incapacity, incompetence, impotence, and asexuality. Okay, so um, unfortunately, the convention did not manage to make a step further if we compare uh, this document to the one from the 90s. Okay. <clears throat> Um, I just, okay, I'm going to conclude because the time uh, is over. Uh, I just, um, I would like just to share the fact that nowadays sexuality is considered um, one of the essential ways of self-expression of the human person. And this quotation is from a decision of the Italian Constitutional Court in the 1987. Okay, so somehow the point is uh, not to uh, argue for a right to sexuality, but to acknowledge that sexuality is very much connected to the um, enactment, I would say, of, very, of many uh, basic human rights, such as right to self-determination, right to health, right to freedom. Uh, self-development and also right to private life. So what we need to discuss is not a new right, uh, right to sexuality, but what we need to discuss is how the expression of sexuality is connected to the fulfillment of many basic human rights. Uh, in the end, of course, I would like to uh, acknowledge that uh, when we are talking about the field of uh, sexuality and disability, there is much to do on the field of, on the side, sorry, of cultural and social change. But of course, law can do something about it because law has a transformative capacity, okay? And in order to do this, we need to unmask the false neutrality of law, and we need to recognize how law itself uh, can uh, perpetuate some stereotypes and misconception, and how law itself is shaped by power structure that are present in our own society. So uh, pushing for a broader social change mean also uh, that law should somehow find its own way to affirm in a positive way the agency of people with disability as sexual beings in our own society. So um, I think that I'm going to conclude and maybe we have some time for uh, your question or consideration and uh, thoughts. Um, thanks for your attention. Thank you. That was uh, genuinely 
fascinating for me. And it has been an eye opener, especially when it comes to the notion of uh, sexual accessibility, which I have to admit this term at first sounded a little bit odd to me. But, but then when I realized that it's, it's mostly about the access to the uh, psychological, social and cultural supports that uh, enable one to uh, fully, you know, develop their sexual autonomy and uh, negotiate access to relationships and things like that, you know, it, it was suddenly such an eye opener. Uh, and I realized that, yes, it has always struck me as really weird that we're talking about positive rights to sexuality and, and how uh, disabled people shouldn't be deprived of them when actually a lot of the hindrances uh, before them are not strictly legal per se, but more like of a social nature. So what, what really stands in the way is... Uh, perceptions and public perceptions and misconceptions rather than a lack of uh, positive rights to sexuality or whatever. So sexual citizenship has been a really interesting concept for me and also sexual accessibility. Can you please remind me who coined the terms? Uh, which one? You mean sexual citizenship? Sexual citizenship first uh, and, and then about sexual accessibility. I just want yeah. to put the names down. Yeah, of course. I mean, um, sexual citizenship actually was a notion that was already uh, elaborated inside the LGBTIQ studies. But yeah, you the, mentioned the, that. Yeah, yeah, the thinkers that uh, uh, thought that it was the case to apply it in disability study as well is Thomas Shakespeare. Thomas Shakespeare. Okay, yeah. I'm just putting yeah. this down. Yeah, and it's you can maybe it's easier if I do. Yeah. Okay, Shakespeare. While Thank you. the notion of sexual accessibility I shared is from Shuttleworth. Shuttleworth, okay. Yeah. Thanks. He, he, he is part of the um, creep theory on disability. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Um, guys, anybody else? Does anybody else have some questions and comments? Do you know how to raise your hand? There is a button down on your screen, down below on the right hand side. It says reactions. So you just oh. click on that and then you click on the hand. And this is how you raise your hand to ask a question. Any questions? Or well, even if you want to write in chat for me, it's okay as well if you don't want to uh, speak. You know. Yeah, or if somebody wants to write in the chat box, that's also okay. The button for the chat box is uh, located on the left hand side of the screen. Right next to the icon that says participants. Maybe, maybe okay, at this point, it may, it maybe I can like uh, give some time to people if they want to elaborate on a talk. Yeah maybe formulate their questions yeah. in the meantime is it okay if i ask another question yeah of course <laughs> yeah i don't want to take advantage of my role as a moderator and a facilitator of the discussion but like i just have so many questions at this point so uh you mentioned that uh certain theories were um so to speak you know further contributing to erasing disabled bodies and making them invisible and like how they fail to address the material and the carnal aspects of disability and so on. Uh, which, which theory are we criticizing? Which theory are, sorry? Which theory acquired this, uh, sorry, uh, which theory attracted this criticism? Uh, the um, social model of disability. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it is the social model of disability. Uh, and uh, this uh, is a, a critique which was made by the um, feminist disability theory, but also the creep theory. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they denounced somehow that, of course, it, I mean, the distinction between impairment and disability, which was first theorized by the social model of disability, was fundamental. OK, in order not to identify disability, disabled people with their impairment. 
and mm -hmm. to make them uh, actually make us um, a political subject. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, to go, I mean, to uh, empower people with disability to uh, claim their rights, their civil rights, their social rights, because finally, I mean, if you are told that you are disabled by your body, if you live in a condition of oppression, you find yourself fighting against your body your futures, your body or your mind. Mm -hmm. Why you are told that you are not disabled by your body, but by social structure, then of course, your condition, which is a condition of discrimination and oppression, is not natural anymore, and you can fight against it. So um, this is like the, the reason why the social model of disability is called the hammer. It's a practical tool for disabled people in order to, uh, to be aware of their condition and the fact that they can claim their rights. At the same time, this uh, distinction between impairment and disability somehow um, erase the experience of living with a disabled body. So what it means, I mean, disability, uh, here in the slide, you can see I've, I wrote disability as a form of embodiment, which because of course, disability is not just a, a social structure, but it's also a form of living one own body. And this part of the experience of disability was completely erased by the social model of disability in order, of course, to, uh, to um, I mean, to contrast the oppression of people with disability, but in the end, it was a part of a, of an, of this experience that was left out. Yeah, okay. I understand. It really is very complicated because for all of these uh, explanatory models, you know, they mean well, but what they do is uh, in order to highlight certain aspects of the disability experience, they uh, diminish uh, others, and you know that's only natural. And and maybe we should think of them as instrument instruments. Sorry, as you said. So mm -hmm. just uh, use them, take them for what they're worth, but not really rely on them fully to gather all of the aspects and and provide a full explanation of all of them at once. So rather than than doing that and you know uh, having all of these ambitions uh, in in an explanatory sense, maybe just rely on them uh, to use them as a tool for a social negotiation or raising awareness or you know negotiating further rights, bringing attention to a certain dimension of what it's like to live with an impairment or a disability. Yeah, because, course. yeah, I, I think I, I probably I'm trying to understand what they had in mind, because it makes sense that if you focus too much on the physical aspect of disability, you wouldn't really think to demand anything from society. You wouldn't it wouldn't really come to your mind uh, to uh, uh, demand uh, any further uh, accommodations for accessibility and so on. Yes, exactly. And they also like, they, especially when it comes to the social model of disability, they needed to do this because of the medical gates, I would say, uh, yeah, yeah. around disabled bodies. And yeah, they, they, like, they needed somehow to uh, completely change the way of viewing disability. Uh, so it's not that bodies need to be adjusted uh, just like it was uh, said by the medical well, medical model of disability, it's society that needs to change. You see how like the, the yeah. ship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was uh, very productive, I think, in that regard. But uh, it's only logical that it can't do all of the work, especially in a theoretical sense. Yeah. Mm -mm. I love the cover image that you chose for your slides. It's really beautiful. Oh, 
Yeah. Uh, do, do you do you know the um, the artist? No, no. I I haven't seen it before, but oh. I really like it. Okay, thank you. Actually, th this is a, a a portrait of Alison Lapper. Uh, she's an artist and a performer herself, and this statue is called Alison Lapper Pregnant. And the this the artist is from uh, UK, and in general, he does capture of non-conforming bodies. Wow. Yeah, I would love to check this out. Uh, can you yeah. please write the name in the chat box so I know how it's spelled? Uh, yeah, of course, of course, I can Thanks. write this to you in the chat. Just, it's, oh, I cannot find the chat, just a moment. Where? There's somewhere down in the middle, uh, no, yeah. on the left-hand side. Mm. <laughs> right next to the uh, participants icon. Oh, ah, okay. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Alison Lapper Pregnant. This is like the name of the... Um, Alison Lapper Pregnant, yeah. And then, I don't remember the exact name of the artist. I would check it so that I can write this to you. No, oh, it's, it's great. It's really great. Mark Queen. It's Mark Queen, the name of the artist. And you say he does mostly um, differently abled bodies in his art? I would say non-conforming bodies in general. Non-conforming bodies in general, yeah. yeah that's yeah. great. Uh, also like uh, trans people. Mm -hmm. So it's a more uh, like broad um, concept or idea of uh, what is considered non-conforming when it comes to bodies, not just uh, disabled people. Yeah, but I mean, it, this is spectacularly beautiful. I'm glad you like it. Yeah. And also, wait, I wanted to share again. The, okay. At the end of the slide, I have this. Um, if you're into art, maybe you will. Yeah, hear, actually, I like am. This. And it's again uh, around the notion of non conforming <laughs> bodies and sexuality. Uh, and this one is from an Italian artist. She is called MP5. You see, this is the kind of exhibition that I would love to see in my homeland. And I'm just wishing that we had more art exhibitions like this in Bulgaria, which for some reason we don't, or at least I, I don't think I've ever seen anything like this before. Yeah. Mm. I mean, even in Italy, uh, I haven't seen like a, a proper exhibition around this kind of uh, concept or, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah, I've been seeing something while traveling, you know? And also in general, this artist MP5, she's also an activist. So mm -hmm. she works a lot on feminist issues broadly, and which is why I know her. She's great, really. Oh, and you've met her in person. What? Uh, have you met her in person? Uh, actually, uh, no, I I haven't. But uh, mm -hmm. mm, but some yeah, I mean, some friends of mine know her because she's like from the activist mm, mm -hmm. groups. So somehow we are all interconnected. <laughs> and, yeah. Yeah. I see. I see. I can uh, the name of so this Italian artist, M. P. Cinque. I just wrote the name in yeah. chat. If you want to check more? I, I've just the word. Seen... Thank great. you so much. Yeah, I will definitely. I will be googling <laughs> this as we speak. Any other questions? Right. I believe that our audience does not really have any further questions and comments. Yeah, for the time being, but maybe if they do, they could reach you via email. Yeah, of course. If you want, I can share again the last slide where there is my uh, email, one of my emails. <laughs> if you want, you can write me here. And of course, I am uh, willing to answer question or if you want to share some thoughts. And yeah, I will. I would be very glad to hear from you.
I think we have all learned a lot and also enjoyed it because this was a super interesting presentation in addition to being very uh, informative. So thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye, Carla. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Have a lovely day.